I guess the first thing I should tell you is that your guest and mine is Patrick McGoohan. Uh, Mr. McGoohan, uh, known familiarly to his, uh, his fans as number six, was the uh, creative force behind, uh, executive producer of, and in several places, places, or on several occasions, the scriptwriter of a series called The Prisoner, which has appeared on television a number of times, not least notably uh, on this network. Mr. McGoon has come here from uh, Los Angeles to meet you and talk to you and to me and to meet with a group of uh, what prisoner closet groupies, some of them from Seneca College, which has been operating a course based on the series, some of them from OECA, some other people. And we're going to talk about the prisoner. And I suppose the obvious first question is, uh, where the hell did that idea come from? How did you get started? Uh, boredom. Just uh, that. Was how it started. Uh, with really. TV or with society or with you? Uh, with TV, initially, um, I was doing a series that was called uh, Secret Agent. Mm -hmm. uh, was it called that here or Danger Man? It had two titles. Danger Man here. Danger Man, yes. Yep. And I'd made uh, 54 of those. And I thought that was an adequate amount. So I went to the gentleman, uh, Lou Grade, who was the financier, and said I'd like to cease making a secret agent and uh, do something else. So he didn't like that idea. He preferred that I'd gone on forever doing it. Um, but anyway, I said I was going to quit. So he said, what's the idea? This was on the telephone initially. So I met him on a Saturday morning at 7 o'clock, which was always the time that we had our discussions. And uh, he said, all right, what's the idea? And I had a whole format prepared of this prisoner thing. Um, which initially came to me on one of the locations on Secret Agent when we went to this uh, place called Port Million, where it was a great deal of it was shot. And I thought it was an extraordinary place. And that's how you found the place? It was a we went there on location. When you were doing the, the Danger Man series. Yeah. And um, I thought it was an extraordinary place architecturally and atmosphere-wise and should be used for something. And that, were, that was two years before the concept came to me. So I prepared it and went in to see Blue grade. I had photographs of the village, or whatever, and a format. And uh, he said, I don't want to read the format because he doesn't read formats. He says he can't read apart from accounts. <laughs> and uh, he, he sort of said, well, uh, what's it about? Tell me. So I talked for 10 minutes. <coughs> and uh, he stopped me and said, I don't understand one word you're talking about, but how much is it going to be, you see? So I had a budget with me, oddly enough. and. Uh, I told him how much. He says, when can you start? I said, Monday, on scripts. And he says, the money will be in your company's account on Monday morning, which it was. And that's how we started. Also, the, behind it, of course, was a certain impatience with uh, uh, the numerology of society and the way we're being made into ciphers. So there was a, something else behind it as well. Was that a personal thing in, in, in terms of your reaction to society, or was it more of a, an observation? Do you feel you're I being... I think we're progressing too fast. I think that we should pull back and uh, consolidate the things that we've discovered. You didn't initially want to do 17 films? No, uh, seven as uh, a serial as opposed to a, a series. And mm -hmm. I thought that uh, the concept of the thing would sustain for only seven. But then Lou Grade wanted to make his sale uh, to CBS, I believe, first ran it in the States. And he said he couldn't make a deal unless he had more. And he wanted 26. And I couldn't conceive of 26 stories uh, because it would be spreading it very thin. But we did manage over a weekend with my writers to cook up uh, 10 more outlines. And then eventually we did 17, but it should be seven. But you did 10 in, what, two days? 10 outlines? Over the weekend, yes. Outlines, I mean a sort of <laughs> seven or eight page format. How did you, how would you have described or explained the concept of the series to those writers was the first time you sat down with them? What did you tell them? It was very difficult because uh, they were also prisoners of conditioning. And they were used to writing for, you know, the, the Saint series or Secret Agent series. And uh, it was very difficult to explain. We, had, we lost a few by the wayside. Um, I uh, 
sat down and I wrote a 40-page uh, sort of history of the village, the sort of telephones they used, the sewage system, what they ate, the transport, the boundaries, um, a description of a village, every aspect of it. And they were all given <coughs> copies of this. And then naturally we talked to them uh, about it and sent them away and hoped they'd come up with an idea that was feasible. What about the philosophy, the rationale of the village? What did you tell them about that? It's raison d'etre, not its mechanics, but it's, it's got a place that is trying to destroy the individual by every means possible, trying to break his spirit so that he, he accepts that he's number six and will live there happily as number six forever after. And uh, this is the one rebel that they can't break. <clears throat> to what end was that process of breaking down the individual will? To what end? Mm -hmm. For the village. What was the purpose, the goal? I think it's going on every day all around us. I had to <coughs> sign in to get into this joint. Mm -hmm. Me Downstairs, too. yeah. Made you angry too? <clears throat> Slightly, yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> right. uh, pass keys, you know, and let's go down to the basement and all this. Mm -hmm. That's prisonership as far as I'm concerned. And that makes me mad. And that makes me rebel. And that's what the prisoner was doing, was rebelling against that type of thing. But can you, in everyday life, can you, can you summon the will and the energy to rebel every time that kind oh, you of petty can't. indignity occurs? You can't, otherwise you go crazy. You have to live with it. That's what makes us prisoners. Uh, you can't rebel, otherwise you have to go and live on your own, on a totally rebel, or you have to go and live on your own on a desert, on a desert island. And how it's much, as simple as that. How much psychic attrition is there, spiritual attrition? I don't understand in that. Not rebelling. How much do you give away or lose? How high is the cost of not rebelling every time? Ulcers. I'm not complaining every time. Ulcers. Do you have ulcers? I have a couple. Bad ones? Not too bad. They're getting worse <laughs> as we go <laughs> Minute on, by minute. Sure <laughs> <laughs> yeah. How many of the scripts did you write? Your name was on two. Well, I, my name was on two, and then I wrote under a uh, couple of other names. Archibald Schwartz was one, and uh, Patty, <coughs> Patty Fitz was another. So how many altogether? I think, uh, I think five. Mm-hmm. Which yeah. ones? The well, last the one. First one I I, uh, I rewrote. It came out uh, not the way I wanted, and then but the last one I wrote, the penultimate one I wrote, um, free for all is another one, and then there was another one I I can't I can't remember the name of it offhand. It's a long time ago. What's your response to what is could really only be adequately described as a cult, which has grown up around that series, a, a kind of mystique about it here and in Europe. Uh, yes, I'm, I, I'm very gratified because uh, when it came out originally in uh, England, um, there were a lot of haters of it. It was, either, it was a love-hate relationship, uh, whichever way you looked at it. Uh, and already there was a small cult, now there's a much bigger one over there. Uh, in fact, the, when the last episode came out in England, it had one of the largest viewing audiences, they tell me. Uh, ever over there, because everyone wanted to know who number one was, you see, because they thought it would be uh, uh, James Bond type <coughs> number one. Uh, when they did finally see it, there was a near riot, and uh, I was going to be lynched, and I had to go into hiding in the mountains for uh, two weeks till things calmed down. Absolutely true. They were angry? Oh, yeah. Walking around the streets, it was dangerous Why? for me. Why were they angry? Because they thought they'd been cheated because it wasn't, you know, a, a, a James Bond number one guy. It was themselves. Yeah, well, we'll get into that later, I think. <laughs> Come back to that one later. But you know, that's, what, that's a very important one. Do you know what's really interesting is that a number of, to me, a, a number of my friends and colleagues who watched the entire series told me after the last show that they were angry because they hadn't found out who number one was. Well, it that slipped by quickly and they refused to acknowledge it. That was deliberate. Um, I forget how many frames, I think there were 52 frames or something of the, of the shot when you pulled off the, the monkey mask <coughs> and number one's a monkey and then number one's himself. It was deliberate. I mean, I could have held it there for a good two minutes and put a subtitle on it saying it's him, you know. <laughs> but uh, I thought that I wasn't going to pander to a mentality so low that it couldn't perceive the, the, what, what I was trying to say. So you had to be a little quick to pick it up. That's all. What 
is your response to all of the analysis and all of the philosophizing and criticism of the series? People have tried to make so much of it and to find so many levels of meaning and to parse it in so many directions. Uh, I'm astonished. Uh, for instance, uh, the beautiful presentation, I think, that you prepared for, for our, our good friends here, uh, puts profounder meanings into many of the stories than I ever thought of. Or more uh, pompous. Yeah. No, <laughs> no, no, not at all. No, no. I, I, I think it's marvelous. Uh, I'm most gratified. Some questions over here. How did you feel about the response to The Prisoner when it was first shown in Britain? Delighted. Uh, I wanted to have uh, controversy, argument, fights, discussions, people in anger, waving fists in my face, saying, how dare you? Why don't you do more secret agents that we can understand? Uh, I was delighted with that reaction. I think it's a very good one. That was the intention of the exercise. Did you get uh, any special kind of response from politicians, from bureaucrats, people in the kinds of corporations that we all know and hate? Not, a, not enough. Uh, I, I suppose they steered clear of it, but then, of course, they'd be the very ones that wouldn't understand it. Mm -hmm. Was there any one that was more fun for you than the other? Was it fun playing a Western, uh, a Western hero for a few well, frames, a few scenes? We, now, I don't know what concepts <coughs> you good folks have put on that one, but the reason for that, I'll tell you, is because I wanted to do a Western. I'd never done one, and they'd never made a Western in England, and we were short of a story, uh, so we, we cooked that one up. Uh, <laughs> and we wrote it in four days and uh, uh, shot it, you know. And it was, it was it was fun. Yeah, mm -hmm. it was fun. I mean, whatever you put into it, that's that's the reason for it. Uh, then we sort of stuck the figures up and all that and put some other concepts in, which have uh, other levels, sociological levels, which you can take what you want out of them. Can you make a decent uh, creative enterprise, build one uh, in any medium without building it on several levels at once, wh however much of it is conscious or subconscious? It's very, uh, a lot of it was conscious in, 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 in my case there, and then of course other things happened. For instance, uh, a thing that happened, the balloon thing, which has been made uh, a great deal of. Rover. Rover, yes. Now the reason that happened, and again, it's like the, it's like the Western. Uh, this, uh, we had this marvelous piece of machinery that was being built, which was going to be Rover, you know, and this thing was like a hovercraft, and it would go underwater, come up on the beach, climb walls, it could do anything. This was our original rover. And by the first day of shooting, unfortunately, the engineers, mechanics, and scientific geniuses hadn't quite completed it to perfection. <laughs> and uh, the first day of shooting, rover was supposed to go down off the beach into the water, do a couple of signals, and a couple of wheel spins, and come back up. But it went down into the water and <laughs> stayed <laughs> down permanently. <laughs> and uh, then we had to shoot. We had Rover in every scene that day, so we had no Rover. And Rover didn't look as though he was going to be resurrected at all. So we're standing there, my production manager, Bernard Williams, wonderful fellow, um, standing beside me, and he says, what are we going to do? And he went like that. And he looked up, and there was this balloon in the sky. And he says, what's that? And I said, I don't know. What is it? He says, I think that's a meteorological balloon. And he looked at me, and I said, how many can you get within two hours, see? So he says, I'll see. And he went off, called the meteorological station nearby, <coughs> and I did some other shots to cover while he was away. And he came back with a hundred of them. He took an ambulance so that he could get there and back fast, because it was quite a ways to the nearest big town. And he came back with them, and there were these funny balloons, mm -hmm. all sizes. And that's how Rover came to be. And sometimes we filled it with a little water, sometimes with oxygen, sometimes with helium, depending on what we wanted him to do. You know, and in the end, we could make him do anything, lie down, beg, anything. <laughs> <laughs> really. You didn't we, used, we used about 6,000 of them. Did you really? Oh, yes. They're very, very fragile. They break very easily. So you'd, you'd lose a lot of scenes then when you were shooting at Rover? Well, we always had another one standing by, backups all the time. What interested me was the style in which it was done, and the, the whimsy, and the, the hundreds of little touches. Mm -hmm. But from everything you've been saying so far, they all seem to be in accidents. You know, the, the white balloon was an accident, you happened upon the village. Yeah. It's yeah. incredibly lucky. Yeah, but you, no, 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 
there were these pages, don't forget, at the very beginning, mm. uh, which laid out the whole concept. These 40 odd pages laid out the whole concept. That was no accident. No, but the little touches of oh, those, those things come anyway. But those I haven't things. seen them come very often in any other series. But they come because you're looking for them, you see. And uh, I, I was fortunate to have uh, two or three creative people w working with me, like my friend that I said saw the, saw the meteorological balloon. Yeah. And uh, wherever one could find these little touches, uh, one put them in. But the design of it, mm. of, of the prison, I think, that was all clearly laid out from the outset. And the style of the, uh, the, the way The style was also it. clearly laid out. And the designs of the sets, there was, they were all clearly laid out from, from the inception of it. There was no accident in that area. You know, the blazers and the numbers and all, all that stuff, and the stupid little bicycles and all that. Was it a series, do you think, which, which had uh, an appeal, a kind of narrow gauge appeal, chiefly due to people uh, in the upper 20% of the intelligence quotient bracket or whatever? Mostly uh, intelligent people such as we have here. Indeed, uh, yes. Yeah. I meant that. Uh, you see, one of, the, one of the things that is frustrating about uh, making a piece of entertainment is trying uh, to make it appeal to everybody. Um, I think this is fatal. I don't think you can do that. Uh, it's, it's done a great deal, you know, we have our horror movies and we have our science fiction things. Mm -hmm. uh, the best works are those that say, somebody says we want to do something this way, and do it. Not because they're aiming at a particular audience. Uh, they're doing it because it's a story they think is important. And it's a statement that they want to make. And they do it, and then whoever wants to watch it, that's their privilege. I mean. The, uh, paintings in an art gallery, you know, uh, you have a choice whether you go and look at this one or that one or the other one. You have a choice not even to go in. Uh, one analogy that comes up from literature is with uh, epic poetry, or with an epic. Mm. And uh, the um, prisoner seems to have all the qualities that, that belong to an epic, including the kind of structure which you ended up with, the thing that began with seven parts and ended with 17. Yeah. There have been a few peculiar uh, epic works which have done that sort of thing or have been on the way. Spencer's Fairy Queen, for instance, mm -hmm. or Tennyson's Idols of the Kings, mm -hmm. Idols of the King, which became a 12-part non-epic with all the properties and qualities of an epic. I only have one question uh, based on the <clears throat> perhaps peculiar observation. And that is, uh, one of the figures in some of the epics, like the Fairy Queen, is a dwarf who accompanies Una and uh, Red Cross Knight. Um, where did the idea for Angelo Muscat oh, dear, come from? Oh, I don't know. Uh, where did that come from? Is there, is there a literary image? No, I, never, I certainly never there? thought of one. Uh, there are all sorts of interpretations to little, little Angelo. Uh, he's a sweet man. Um, and very, very sweet man. It's this sort of, there this, this should be something also sinister about him. I mean, there was always the possibility that he might be number one. So I don't know if anyone, did you pick up that at all? I don't know. But that was because he was such a good friend and always by the side of number six, that there was, should have been an implication that perhaps he was a sinister character. And particularly in the last episode, uh, when he, Goes, he's the one that goes out with number six, and they go into the, the house. Maybe he's over number one somewhere. You know, they have mm -hmm. super, they have stars, superstars, and what are they going to call them next? Comets. So whatever, maybe he's a comet or something, a little little Angelo. So this should be that remaining sinister thing about it. There. We're just curious because there are so yeah. many images yeah. of of all the figures that are in the the series that are. Yeah that have literary connections, whether or not they're deliberate, uh, yeah. deliberately connected or not, doesn't really matter. Doesn't no, it, I don't, I don't, I don't of, think it does. No, it doesn't matter at I all. I don't think, uh, in, in that sort of, uh, I, I use the word surrealistic about it, that, thing, that one has to tie up <coughs> all the loose ends. I think that should, options are open for the beholder to interpret whichever way he likes. Mr. McGowan, uh, my question deals with uh, religion. I understand in reading a little bit about you that you are a very religious man. And uh, 
My question pertains to fallout. I have interpreted a lot of the acts as being having this content. I'm thinking specifically of uh, the crucifixion of the two rebels when their arms are drawn apart, the temptation of number six by the president of the village, mm -hmm. uh, the temptation of Christ. Yeah, to dry, assume the throne. Yeah. Right, dry bones yeah, right bones out of Ezekiel. Yeah. All of that, uh, first of all, would you agree with the, my idea that that is intentional, that it is? Um, answering, uh, no, I had never any religious inspiration for that whatsoever. I was just trying to make it uh, uh, dramatically feasible. Certainly the, the temptation with the guy putting me up on the throne and all this stuff, that's, you know, uh, that's Lucifer time. Um, but I never thought of it at that moment, but maybe somewhere at the back of my mind it was there and the hip bones connected to the thigh bone thing, uh, I just thought it was a very good song for the situation, you know, and also it was applicable to the, uh, to the young man uh, because, as you know, it's easy for us to go astray in youth, and he was astray, and he <coughs> was trying to get everything together again. When I speak of religion, I mean uh, a moral attitude towards I life. I would think that's uh, necessary, yeah. Okay, then. Uh, is it fair to say that number six draws upon that? Is that the source of his defense? Is that how he gets up in the morning and faces another day in the village? I think that's a very good comment, and I think that uh, it, it's probably true, yeah. I mean, it, 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 moral force, uh, which says I have a, a, a spirit of my own, a mind of my own, a soul of my own, and it's not all my own because it's joined with a greater force beyond me. I don't think he got up every morning and analyzed it to that extent, but I think that that force is within him. And anyone who is able to fight in that uh, individual way, I think, has it. Would you say that there is a distinct lack in the rest of the villagers? Are they soulless beings? Uh, the, the majority of them have been sort of brainwashed. Their souls have been brainwashed out <coughs> of them. Yeah. To, watching too many commercials, I think, is what, <laughs> what happened to them. Yeah. I used to think that television commercials were, were spiritually healthy because they made us skeptical and that that was probably a very good thing to learn very early on. Well, they don't make enough people skeptical because if they made enough people skeptical, uh, the people who were made skeptical wouldn't be buying all the junk that they're advertising and then they'd be out of business. Uh, there's one sequence you do with Leo McKern where mm. he says, I'll kill you. You say, I'll die. And he says, you're dead. Mm. Uh, is that a figure of speech? Or was there something happening, an underlying thing happening there? Uh, you're talking about Once Upon a Time. Once Upon a Time. Well, that was very interesting, that one, because you said, which was my favorite episode uh, earlier on, uh, Warner, uh, that was probably it. Uh, that was one that was written in the 36-hour period. And uh, Leo McKern, who is a good friend of mine, a fine actor, I think, uh, came in at short notice to do it. And it was mainly a two-hander a brainwashing thing. He was trying to brainwash me, and in the end, number six turns the tables. And the dialogue was so peculiar, because all it consisted of mainly was six, 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 and five pages of that at one time. And uh, Leo, uh, one lunchtime, went up to his dressing room, and I went to, the, to, the, to see the rushes. And uh, I knew he was tired. I went up to the dressing room to tell him how good I thought he'd been in the, in the rushes. And he was coiled up in the fetus position on his couch there. And he says, go away, go away. He says, I don't want to see you again. I said, what are you talking about? He says, I've just ordered two doctors, he said. And they're coming over as soon as possible. He says, go away. And he had, he'd ordered two doctors. And uh, they came over that afternoon, and he didn't work for three days. He was, he'd gone, he cracked which was very interesting. It was terrific pressure, you see. And uh, so I had to use <coughs> a double the back of a guy for a lot of the shots. And eventually Leo did come back and we completed it. And also he was in the final episode, so he forgave me for everything. But he, he did crack. It was interesting. I thought. Much as he well, cracked, force. much as he cracked in that episode. Yeah. The second last episode. Same, exactly the same. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I was wondering about how much intensity there was in that. I, you know, I know that acting is an, always an enormously intense experience, but in that head-on two-hander, where there was so much dynamic and pressure, well, obviously it, it was real. It was eight days shooting, uh, and for most of those eight days, we were head-to-head-on for from 
8 o'clock in the morning till uh, 6.30 at night with an hour for lunch. So it was pretty intense. It was psych psychiatrist couch time sort of thing. You know. Were you a different person when you came out the other end of that series? Tired, that's all. Beyond that? No, no. It wasn't purely psychoanalysis? You didn't? No, uh, I, I never uh, let uh, uh, any part that I play sort of take over. I think that's nonsense that, that happens. I think you should be able to go in and do it, learn your lines, do it. Some are more fatiguing than others. Some are more emotionally exhausting than others. I mean, you can't play Hamlet without being uh, drained or uh, King Lear without being drained. But to say that you live through the day playing Lear or playing Hamlet before you go out the next night and go onto the stage, I think that's ludicrous. What about the notion some actors, uh, some people in other creative endeavors have, that we all have a, a finite bank of energy and that each time one burns some of it up, there's a little less left for next time or for the other end of the road? I think that it's the, I think the contrary is true. Uh, when one looks at people such as Arthur Rubinstein, Pablo Casals, uh, people of the tremendous talents, and the young men, mm -hmm. the young men that, you know, 75, they're young, 80, they're young. Their vitality, in fact, increases. Uh, their energy increases. It just happens, I mean, the mental energy, the force, the adrenaline increases. It just happens that the, the machinery of the body, uh, the parts, the spare parts are wearing out a little bit. But the energy, I think, and I mean, Arthur Rubinstein is a phenomenon, for instance. Yeah, yeah. I think it increases, and I know a lot of old folks who are young, young people. So the creative urge is a muscle. The more we flex it, the stronger I it gets. I think so, yeah. yeah. It's just this stuff wears out. That's all. Mr. McGowan, when, uh, when you began The Prisoner, you, you began it in a decade in which uh, I think a lot of people were used to secret agents. It was the decade of the Ipcress file and so on. And uh, you very neatly saw the next decade coming. I think you saw uh, Watergate, the enemy within, as opposed to the enemy without. Um, I don't know if you can answer this, but if you were going to do the series again today, and you had to look ahead to the 80s, and you were thinking in terms of what you're going, you see as, as being the real enemy, not, not the storybook enemy, but the enemy that's really going to hassle us. Um, if, if you were to look into the 80s now, uh, what would you look to? I think progress is uh, the biggest enemy on earth apart from oneself. And that goes with oneself, the two-handed pair with oneself, and with progress, uh, I think we're going to take good care of this planet shortly. They're making bigger and better bombs, faster planes, and all this stuff one day. I hate to say it, there's never been a weapon created yet on the face of the earth that hasn't been used. And that thing's going to be used. Unless, I don't know how we're going to stop it now. It's too late, I think. Do you think maybe there's going to be a, a strong popular reaction against, quote, progress? in the future? No, because uh, we're run by the Pentagon, we're run by Madison Avenue, we're run by television, uh, and as long as we accept those things and don't revolt, uh, we'll have to go along with the stream to the eventual, eventual avalanche. Mr. McGowan, uh, we, we tend to view uh, the threat, the village sort of thing, as something external a lot, like Madison Avenue, the media. How much do you feel is, um, like, how responsible are we for accepting this? Like, wh where do we become involved in, in being unfree sort of thing? Buying the products to excess. Uh, I don't, as long as, as, long as uh, we go out and, you know, buy stuff, we're at their mercy. We're at the mercy of the advertisers, and of course there are certain things that we need but uh, a lot of the stuff that is bought is not needed. Okay, do you regard the village as an external thing or something that we carry around with us all the time? It was meant to be both. The external was the symbol, but it's, it's, the t it's within us all, I think, don't you? This, the surrealistic aspect of it. Yeah. We all live in a little village. We live in a 
Now, very... Your village may be different from other people's villages, but we all got to... Well, or that, uh, I know who the idiot is in mine, which is... <laughs> yeah, number, number one, same, That's as, right. same as me. That's right. uh, is uh, number one the evil side of man's nature? Uh, the greatest enemy that we have... I mean, number one was depicted as an evil governing force in this village. So who is this number one? We just see the number twos, the sidekicks. Now this overriding evil force is at its most powerful within ourselves, and we have constantly to fight it, I think. Uh, and that is why I made number one an image of number six, his other half, his alter ego. Did you know when you first outlined the series in your own mind, the concept, that number one was going to turn out to be you, to be number six? No, I didn't. That's an interesting question. When did you find out? Uh, when it got very close to the last episode, and I hadn't written it yet. And I had to sit down this terrible day and write the last episode. May I have one, please? Mm-hmm. And I knew that it wasn't going to be something out of James Bond. And in the back of my mind, there was some parallel with, with the character six and the, and the number one and the rest. Uh, and then I didn't really know exactly till I was at a, about a third through the script, the last script. Go ahead. How about, okay. your, how about your colleagues, the other writers? Were they surprised? Yeah. Were they annoyed? Did no. they decide it was untidy? No, they used to come along from time to time and say, uh, uh, who, who's uh, number one, you see? I mean, uh, and I, I told them I'm, it's a secret until we eventually wrote it. And it was, actually, and they didn't know until I handed out the script. But were they disappointed by that No, they, li they liked it. They said they always knew it was going to be himself. <laughs> Once you told them, they... No, a few of them did, really, <laughs> but they didn't. Nobody really did. No. Why the double mask? Why the monkey first? Oh, dear. Or was there a reason? Yeah, you know, because we're all supposed to come from these things, you know, and uh, it's the same as the penny farthing uh, symbol, bicycle thing. Progress, you know. I don't think we've progressed much. But the, uh, the monkey thing was we're all supposed to, according to various theories extant these days, come from the original ape, so I just used that as a symbol, you know. Mm -hmm. The bestial thing and then the, the other bestial face behind it, which is laughing and jeering and jabbering like a, like a monkey. Mr. Magoo, and during the last episode, Fallout, uh, we see the prisoner, he's smiling and laughing and dancing for the first time, and yet uh, later on, the very last scene is exactly the same as the very first scene, yeah. where he's driving off with his familiar stern face. Yeah. My question is, has the prisoner between the first and the last episodes actually changed any? Uh, no, I think he's essentially the same. Um, I think he got slightly exhilarated by the fact he got out of this mythical place and felt like doing a little skip and a dance uh, and singing a bit and felt very happy to be going back home with his little buddy, uh, the butler, you know. And uh, we, never, we never did a cut of him when that door opened. We just saw the door open and he went in with the, with the butler. Uh, so you never knew whether his exhilaration was lost when he saw that sinister door or not. That was left in abeyance, uh, unfinished. Symphony. In the uh, final episode, does the prisoner really consider becoming uh, the leader of the village? No. Uh, he does not. Uh, he just wants to get out. And he uses a technique which he hasn't used before that, which is violence. Which is sad, but he does. And that's how he gets out. And then, of course, in the final episode, he goes back to his little apartment place, and he has his little valet guy with him and the door opens on its own and he goes in cars there and that so you know it's going to start all over again because we continue to be prisoners and that leads to my last question what would the former prisoner be likely to do with his newfound freedom he hasn't got it which is the whole point when that door opens on its own and there's no one behind it exactly the same as all the doors in the village open you know that somebody's waiting in there to start it all over again. He's got no freedom. 
freedom is a myth. There's no final conclusion to it. Uh, and I was very fortunate to be able to do something as au audacious as that with no final conclusion to it. Uh, because people do want the word the end put up there. Now the final two words for that thing should have been the beginning. This is a kind of banal question, I guess. But if you could leave one sentence or phrase or paragraph in the head of everyone who watched the Prisoner series, the whole series, one thing for them to carry around for a while when it was over, what would it be? Be seeing you. Just that. Enigmatic yeah. to the end. Be seeing you. And it means quite a lot. Of it does indeed. Be seeing you. Well, I guess after all of the analysis and interpretation and all like that there, uh, the nice thing about it in the real world is you get to make all those decisions for yourself about who's making the rules uh, in your village and what you should do about that. Your guest has been Patrick Magoon. Thank you for letting us join you. Be seeing you.